when learning something new, there are many different paths you can go. You can watch YouTube tutorials, you can read books, you can ask people, hire a tutor, and so on. So all of these are viable options. And I think that most of the people just watch some YouTube tutorials, which I think is a good start, but I would not consider it the best way to learn. Because what I think is even better than watching someone do it is actually reading about it, which is what I have done recently, that I have read the book Code Complete 2, which is about 1000 pages long, so it's quite in-depth textbook. And in this kind of review style video, I want to tell you what I have learned while reading it. Why I think that reading books is better than watching tutorials is because the tutorials often don't really go into depth. Most of the time they are focused on the beginners and also the tutorials may not be so easy to focus on because there may be some distracting elements, some music and you don't really need to do anything. You can just watch the screen and you don't really need to pay attention. But when reading a book, you need to know on which page you are, what word you are trying to read and it just requires a bit more focus to actually read the book. The major discovery I made while reading the book is that the expert programmers are not really that much smarter than you. They obviously are a bit smarter, they know some algorithms, but programming is not really about increasing your brain power to be able to remember more or to be able to go through harder problems, even though it is a part of it. Programming is really more about just making the code easier for you, so you don't have to think about everything at once, so this is the main realization I had. When you are not really sure how to code something, maybe you are going about it in a wrong way. There are really different techniques you can use to make the coding easier for you without really needing to be smarter. Another main idea of the book was that you should write the programs for people first and for computers second. Because the computer can pretty much always understand the code. It's just going character by character and it doesn't really care about how the code is structured or how it looks. It just needs to have the correct syntax. But with people, however, it works differently, because if you are trying to read the code, you just look at the structure of the code. So first you see generally what kind of classes and functions you have, and then you are going line by line. But overall, the structure of the code can make it really easy for you to be able to find the part of the code that you need. Another thing I will have to mention is that you are writing the code just once, but reading it many times, and also other people can read it as well. And this means that you should be a bit more careful about the code you are writing. So if you got some solution in your mind, don't try to put it into the code as fast as you can, but really think about how you could make it more convenient in the future, to expand the code, to make it more readable, and really to come up with a better version of the code. Obviously, don't take it too far, don't be too perfectionist that you are really trying to make everything perfect, then you are not going to get anything done, but also try to think about it a bit more. And one of the main concepts that will help you to make the code more readable, manageable and just better is to use abstraction, which is the ability to engage with a concept while safely ignoring some of its details. As for some real-world examples, let's say that you are writing a book and you say, some guy lived in a small house. You don't say he lived in a pile of bricks, plaster, wood, glass and all of this. You kind of simplify it to make it a bit more abstract. So let's say that you are trying to code some player into your game. Then you can have script player or player mover. Certainly, you are not going to name the script a sprite that can move on player input. This wouldn't really make sense, it would be too long, so if you call it player, you know it is player, it can move, it maybe have some health, and so on. So the abstraction can be applied to classes, functions, and pretty much anything that you code. It can be achieved, for example, using interfaces, so that you don't have to be thinking about any concrete implementation, but you can just think about the interface itself. The second really important topic of the book is encapsulation, which really goes hand in hand with the abstraction. Encapsulation is a little bit more strict because it actually restricts you from seeing the object from any other level of detail. So if again we go into the house analogy, it would actually not allow you to even know or let's say what kind of material the house is made out of. It will just tell you there is a house, it is big 10 meters and 5 meters and maybe it has a green color, but it's not going to tell you whether it is made out of bricks or stone or glass, wood, it's just going to restrict you more. Most of the time this is achieved using the access modifiers, so like private and public. Typically you should be trying to make everything private if you can, or you can also use properties. So abstraction and encapsulation are those two key concepts that you should always be thinking about 
and trying to implement them. Next, let's take a look at how we can make the code more readable. The main thing is that you have to stick to some style. So style is going to determine how you write the color braces, whether you add space somewhere, whether you make the if blocks without the color braces, and style is just based on how you write the code and how you make it look mainly. It's not really important which style you choose, but it is really important that you stay consistent and you keep using the same style, because then the readers of the code know what to expect. So I've prepared two code examples, they both do really pretty much the same thing, the other one is just a little bit less flexible. So we have the good code, you can see this structure pretty well, it has some functions, it's quite long, 45 lines. And then we have the bad code, which you can see is a lot shorter, just 27 lines. But if you just read through it, you don't really know much as what is going on. Most of the variables are badly named, they are written on one line, the syntax is not really consistent at all. So there is a clear difference between those two codes. This code is supposed to be moving the player. So let's take a look at some of the mistakes that we see in the bad code. Obviously this variable is badly named, vector can be really anything, it can be the direction, it can be the position, movement speed, rotation, so this should be named player position. Then everything is also public, I don't think it's necessary to be accessing the score outside of the player, maybe we could make some accessor for it or to store it somewhere else. Well it can be public, it just depends on the use case. You can also see that all these variables are defined just on one line, so if you want to add some attribute to it, like in the square brackets, it will be adding it to all of these, so that's also not really good. Ideally, you should be declaring one variable on one line, then we have the function control player. Again, this isn't really specific, it doesn't tell us whether it's just rotating the player, moving, or whether it is handling all of the controls, which I think should not be the way to do it. You should split into separate functions, so we have a bad name. Then we have a single line if statement, which can definitely work this way. But then we have another if statement, which also has one line, but we can see this using a different style. Here we don't have the color braces, and here we have them. Now for the condition of the if statement, this is pretty crazy. It should probably be included in some other variable, because this way it is not really readable at all. We are also repeating the code, it's also not good. And we can see that here we are not using the shorthand, the plus equals, but here we are using it. So again, we have two different styles for adding something. Then we have the function faster, which we can see is called async public. So these two are in a different order, because typically you start with the accessor, so whether it is public or private. So we should just reverse those. We cannot really input anything. And if we take a look at the good code, here we can see what I told you. We have a better class name. We have also some data structure, player stats which is holding all of the underlying data that we need. We could actually make this one private if we don't need to access it. We can see that those two variables are private. They are defined each on a new line. We have the function move. All of these if statements are consistent. We have some additional variables providing more abstraction, but we know that this should do something with the move input. And again, better name for the function. We have some parameters. And also one really effective way to make your code more readable is just to add some empty spaces, as you can see that I've added it here before the delay, because this code is going to run at once, and then this code is going to run. So adding empty spaces, let's say between the functions, or maybe I also typically do it between different types of the variables, so if I have public, and then I have private, I include a space in between, I include space between all of the functions, between classes as well, and the empty lines don't really make the code less effective, the computer still reads it in the same way, but for us humans it will make it a lot more readable, because if you take a look at this code, yeah it is longer, but it's much easier to read it than to read this bad code. So this is it for how we can make the code more readable, and just better to look at. The Another thing that the book was mentioning quite a lot, is that you should program into your language, not in it. So what does this mean? Well, you should not limit yourself only to the features your language provides from scratch. If you find some missing feature, you could implement it by yourself or find an elegant way to work around it. So let's say that you are using some other language, not C-sharp, and that language may not support the switch statement. So then you could try to figure out how you could provide your own switch statement. So maybe you could make some preprocessor macro, some custom function, 
or really try to get around it in some way. The same way, some languages don't have enums, so again, you should find your own way how to include the enum. Another example of providing into your language is using design patterns, because design patterns are considered to be some missing features that the languages should have. I know there are some languages that actually provide some patterns from scratch, but most of them don't, so that's why the patterns were invented, so that we can go around some of the missing features of the language. So generally, if you don't want to code in your language, but you want to code into it, you should start not really thinking about the code in a particular language, you should start thinking about the problem in general. So you have some problem you are trying to solve, try to think about it how you could solve it in a real life without really using the programming tools that you have, and then once you come up with the solution, you may see that some of the tools are missing in the language, so then you can still try to get around it in some way. Another way that you can make the development process easier for you the next time you are trying to develop something is to create your own tools. So I know that when creating the tool, it may take you a lot more time to create it, but then when you actually have the similar problem to that, you already have the tool using which you can simply solve the problem. So building your own tools is really kind of planning into the future. What I mean by creating your own custom tools? Well, in Unity you can create your custom editors. So for example, you may want to be able to select a type in the inspector, which is not provided from default, but if you make a custom tool for it, it'll definitely make your life a lot easier and you will also be able to reuse the tool in the future. Then you may also want to create your own frameworks or some utility libraries containing some common functions that you often find yourself that you need to create from scratch. For example, multiplying vectors, because that's not really provided by Unity from scratch, so that could be a nice function to include in your own utility library. Again, you could create some generic singletons, some dependency injection frameworks, generic state machines, generic service locators, and really anything generic that you would be able to reuse in some later projects. And before you even start working on a project, the book was really emphasizing that you should write high quality and clear requirements. Before I started reading the book, I had really no idea what requirements are, and it is just a set of requirements that the project needs to fulfill for it to be considered complete. So you may think that you are working just on a small project, you don't really need to know how it should look in the end, but if you don't have the requirements, then what is going to happen is that you will make a lot of changes. And obviously the later in the project you make some changes, the more time and money they can cost you. So before you start working on the project, you should have a list of features that the project should have, and you should also think about whether it is possible for you to do it, whether there are maybe some cons and pros of what you have written down, and it's really important because it can save you up to 50% of the time or even more, it depends on how likely you are to make a change in the future. Because if you have no requirements, then it is really simple for you to make changes. But if you have requirements and you know that the later you make the changes, the more they will cost you, you are likely not going to make the change or you are going to change it slightly. So after you have written all of the requirements, you may want to get straight into coding. But as you do that, you may start to realize that you don't know where to start. So the best way is again to do a bit more planning. So really don't be afraid to maybe draw some diagrams, use some other visual tools. Or the best way I think that you can plan code is by writing some pseudocode, which later can also be used as comments. So first, as you open the Visual Studio or some other programming software, just write a few comments that go in the order based of which you need to do something. So let's say that I was creating some inventory system. So first I would just start with all of the empty functions that I need. So I may want to pick up some item, I may want to check for something and so on. Then inside of the function, just write a few comments as for what you need to do in order to pick up the item. So you need to check for item on the ground. Then we probably need to check for empty slot in the inventory. So this is kind of the basic structure of the function and then what you could do is just add a empty line after each of the comments and start to fill it in. So now you know what you need to do and in which order and then it should be simpler to just fill in the smaller parts of the code. And if you write the pseudocode correctly, it may also later be used just as comments in the code so you could actually keep it in, let's say those four comments, fill in the code in between and those comments could provide you some additional clarity when you are reading the code. And as we are getting to the comments, the comments I've written are not really good because the comments should not be describing what the code does, 
because that's where what you can read based on the code. You can read it and you know what it does. But what the comments should be explaining is why the code does it this way or how does it do it. And as you start coding, you may start worrying about some optimizations because you may run the game and see that it is running very poorly. So then you could go into the code and see that yeah, there is something I could optimize. So you make the optimization, let's say that in this case, we are dividing some value by two and the same operation we can use is using the bit shift operator. So this one should be about 50% faster. So then again, in your code, everywhere you may just use the bit shift instead of the dividing. And the same way, there are many other code tuning techniques that can make the code run faster. But in the end, you realize that the code is still running pretty much at the same FPS. Because you first didn't really check that the code was the bottleneck. So when you are thinking about optimizing something, first you should measure where the hotspots are. So check whether the code is the bottleneck and check in which exact script it is. Because most of the time, about 95% of the code you have is not really slowing the game down, but what is slowing it is about 5 of the percent of the heavy logic that is going on. These could be some loops or some advanced algorithms. So first you should check which one of the calculations is really expensive. Then you can try to code tune it. So try to make it run faster. And then only after you verify that the change actually had some impact, you may want to keep the code you have tuned. There are really many other topics that I learned about in the book. The book is really covering pretty much everything about the construction part, so about the coding. It has all the rules when creating functions, variables, classes, all of that. So I just wanted to give you kind of the main things that I learned, but still there is a ton of stuff I could talk about for hours. I hope that this video has at least a little bit encouraged you to maybe read some programming book because really it is a great source of information and you don't only have to read the code complete too, you can really read any programming book and just experiment with it. If you are looking for some bonus content from me, some more in-depth tutorials, check out my Patreon where I'm creating some of these more in-depth guides trying to teach you everything that I know, so check it out. Anyways, I hope that this video was useful. If you have any questions or suggestions, drop them down in the comments. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and I will see you in next videos. Bye!